But it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to ARM uh, for having us. Um, and I'm also very pleased to be back uh, at home to some degree as a former uh, or as an alum of the uh, Scripps Research Institute graduate program right next door. So um, it's a real pleasure to be back in La Jolla. Uh, the obligatory forward-looking statements, of course. Um, <clears throat> Just to briefly introduce uh, Atara, uh, we are a leading off-the-shelf allogeneic T-cell immunotherapy company. We have three pillars to, to, to our organization. Uh, tab cell, which is our late-stage asset in both blood cancers and solid tumors, uh, has breakthrough FDA designation as well as EMA prime designation. Uh, the second pillar is MS. Uh, we'll talk more about T-cell immunotherapy in MS and autoimmune diseases. And then more recently, uh, we have been building uh, a, a set of assets around next-generation CAR-Ts, and ultimately to integrate those next-generation technologies into our off-the-shelf platform. Uh, so we are a late-stage T-cell immunotherapy company with validated targets, uh, working on this innovative platform. Uh, and. Shown up above in the picture is our world-class T-cell immunotherapy manufacturing operations facility uh, and our, many of our staff located in Southern California in Thousand Oaks. Our corporate headquarters is in South San Francisco. Talking a little bit more about our T-cell immunotherapy platform. Um, to first introduce this, I think we have to introduce the topic of Epstein-Barr virus. That's the original oncovirus that was identified uh, in the early 60s. Uh, approximately 95% of adults in the US over age 40 are EBV positive. Most of us, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> so EBV is ubiquitous in the population. Um, it is present in 95% of individuals over the age of 40. Uh, it's a lifelong asymptomatic infection in most individuals. Uh, it primarily infects B cells and epithelial cells. Uh, in some cases, uh, this is well known as infectious mononucleosis or kissing disease. So it's an infection, primary infection of the tonsils, but then it becomes latently infected in the B cells and is implicated in a wide variety of both uh, uh, EBV-associated uh, cancers as well as autoimmune diseases. The most, uh, the most well-known of those is post-transplant uh, uh, post lymphoproliferative disorder, PTLD, uh, and other Burkitt's-type or HIV-related lymphomas. And the commonality of all of these indications is that uh, these are patients that are immunosuppressed. So the adaptive immune system and the, and the, the soldiers of the immune system, T cells, keep EBV lymphomas in check in most of the population. And so most everyone has a very robust T cell immunity to EBV. Um, and that, that actually makes it very convenient in the sense that we have a very broad base of potential donors who have great, healthy, robust T cells in which to select and to expand and to build a library of EBV-directed T cells for these types of indications. And there's also growing evidence that these uh, EBV is implicated in autoimmune disease and, and most, uh, most recognized is multiple sclerosis. So what's special about EBV? Not only is it ubiquitous in the population, um, it's also uh, an immunologically privileged cell. So um, in the sense that uh, not only are the, um, is, are these T cells directed against a non-human target, EBV and EBV antigens, uh, but they're also um, um, able to potentially uh, uh, avoid the negative immunoregulatory elements of the immune system. So for example, if you put these virally directed T cells uh, into high concentrations of Tregs, um, virally directed T cells will generally proliferate and expand whereas human-directed or tumor-directed and other types of T cells will not. And so they're, they're really the ideal system to use as a platform for off-the-shelf development. Um, and of course, you don't need to make any um, gene edits uh, to make these off-the-shelf, uh, so they maintain their donor advantages 
uh, as robust T cells uh, from healthy donors would have. And in addition to that, I think with the level of uh, clinical data available, uh, there has been an overall low rate of GBHD uh, and no CRS um, that's been reported. So it's a very, it's a, it's a well-established system uh, that maintains these uh, benefits and potential benefits. Uh, so just describing what many of those benefits are, once you build a library in advance of EBV-specific T cells, they can be delivered to the patient out of inventory in three to five days. Uh, you don't need to use uh, lymphoproliferative, or sorry, lymphodepleting uh, pretreatment uh, in most cases. And in, uh, they can be precision targeted, they can be HLA matched to the patient, uh, and do not require uh, onerous uh, long-term monitoring of the patient as most of these cells are eliminated readily uh, uh, in the course of around 90 days in most patients. Uh, but in, indeed, after administration, there's only normal, routine, two hours of monitoring uh, once, once the product is delivered. Uh, one important component of the technology platform is the Atara Match Me off-the-shelf uh, T-cell delivery system that Atara, is, uh, Atara and my colleagues are developing. Uh, this is in order to uh, match the HLA information from the clinician and from the medical center. Uh, to do the cell selection algorithm out of our database, uh, as well as to deliver and administer the product and, and uh, through the full supply chain. Moving on to the, uh, the clinical data around tab cell, um, EBV, uh, EB, EBV uh, associated uh, lymphoproliferative disorder, EBV lymphomas, um, are quite common, um, or, or at least um, occur in two to four percent of uh, of uh, transplant patients. Mainly, again, it doesn't matter what transplant, whether a solid organ or a hematologic bone marrow transplant. It's really as a result of the immunosuppression uh, and the T cell immunosuppression that would normally keep EBV lymphomas and EBV uh, in check. Uh, and in the first line, strategies uh, including treating with rituxan is used. Many of these lymphomas are B cell expressing lymphomas. Uh, and that strategy uh, uh, works in some cases, uh, but in about 50 to 60 percent of cases, uh, the patient is either uh, not responsive or refractory to rituxan, and that's most likely as a result of losing the, the CD20 antigen, antigen loss relapse. Um, and the driver of the lymphoma are the oncogenes of EBV. Uh, and so these, uh, you can see after several cycles of rituxan in this patient, this happened to be a bone marrow transplant patient, uh, you see progression of the disease. Uh, and then in a series, tap cell can be readministered. readministered this time, in this case, uh, there were four cycles of tab cell with three doses in each cycle, uh, roughly one month per cycle. And this patient uh, achieved a complete response uh, in, in, this, in the phase two study. Um, and the expected survival post rituxan, so at week zero of that patient uh, based on the historical data is roughly 15 to 56 days. So only a few weeks of survival expected in those patients uh, post rituxan. Other strategies including chemotherapy or reduction of immunosuppression can be used. Uh, however, when using those strategies, in many cases, a, you reduce immunosuppression, you lose the transplant, you lose the organ, or you put the patient at risk for GVHD. Um, and in the case of chemotherapy, again, many of those chemotherapy patients, it can be used in solid organ transplant, but you put the organ at risk. Um, and in many cases, in the bone marrow transplant setting, you almost always lose the bone marrow, and potentially, in many cases, even the patient, unfortunately. So looking at the phase two clinical data, uh, in the uh, sorry, that's a typo, but in the bone marrow transplant setting in HCT, uh, um, there was approximately a 70%, 69% response rate and a 50% response rate in the solid organ transplant setting. Uh, you can see the long-term survival curves here. Uh, in the dark blue, that's the combined responders and non-responders. Uh, but among the responders, what's remarkable, I think, about the data is that uh, whether it was a complete response or a partial response, no patient died of PTLD. Of course, these are very sick patients, and the underlying 
uh, disease can still result in death, which is what you see in the, in the responder group. Uh, but the, uh, the, the non-responders, of course, uh, 16 to 56 days is their expected survival without this treatment. Um, and we have not reached uh, median survival in uh, the HCT setting. Uh, we just reached median survival after about median of two years of follow-up in both cases. Uh, and we have patients out uh, now four to five years in these two phase three studies that were licensed from MSK. It's generally a well-tolerated therapy. And it, in the case of the ongoing phase threes, uh, an ORR of greater than 37% uh, would result in a positive, uh, positive outcome for those phase three studies. Uh, I think the value proposition, just bigger picture, uh, the durable response data, of course, that we just saw, uh, the off-the-shelf, low cost of administration, uh, the, the, the low burden of delivering the therapy, both pre- and post-treatment, um, the potential to minimize uh, the loss of the graft, uh, and it being a cost-effective uh, therapy from the point of view that many transplant patients in general are pediatric uh, and younger in age. Moving on quickly to the T-cell immunotherapy program in MS. Uh, the idea here is actually quite analogous. Uh, analogous. If you think of uh, your in the healthy adult, which has a robust T-cell activity um, with CD8 positive T cells, keeping in control e latently infected EBV B cells. Um, many of these B cells, they are immortalized once they're, they're EBV infected. Um, you can also have EBV infected, uh, of course, terminally differentiated uh, B cells as plasma cells uh, in the CNS. And that as immunity wanes, um, and this is, of course, uh, based on your HLA profile, um, you, you um, in some cases, uh, the population of autoreactive B cells in the CNS um, it can present antigens and lead to an autoimmune cycle, an autoimmune re reactivation cycle. Uh, and so that's the general premise of the mechanism. Uh, the state of the art in MS, uh, I think we'd all agree, is ocrelizumab. It's a B cell targeted agent. It's a broad B cell targeted agent, although it doesn't target plasma cells, of course, that are CD20 negative. Uh, but, but the state of the art is the slowing of progression of MS. Now, of course, ocrelizumab as, a, as an antibody would not be expected to enter um, the brain, the CNS, cross the blood brain barrier uh, very effectively. And so if ocrelizumab is acting, uh, one potential a mechanism is that, that it's acting through a, a pathway, uh, a B cell EBV pathway, um, but it, it's definitely a broad targeted agent, and TABS or, or sorry ATA one one eight eight is a targeted EBV agent um, that may more selectively target EBV infected T cells or B cells, and also readily cross the blood brain barrier. Um, looking at the data from a phase one autologous. Uh, ATA 190 study uh, that was published uh, last year, uh, late last year, uh, we're able to rehabilitate all, all of the MS patients that, that we've identified do not have EBV reactivity. Uh, and so uh, we are able to rehabilitate a certain number of EBV uh, reactivity in uh, approximately five of those patients. And three of the five that we were able to rehabilitate their EBV reactivity uh, had uh, an EDSS score improvement, uh, which would be a dramatic improvement uh, to the state of uh, the st state of the art in the field of the treatment of MS. So, moving on, we have a CAR T program. I know I'm getting the uh, the signal to uh, <laughs> to end the presentation, but uh, putting CAR Ts into EBV T cells uh, or directed T cells is very interesting. Uh, we're building that pipeline um, most recently. And we have a number of near-term and mid-term milestones uh, over the coming, uh, coming years. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll end it there. Great.